Welcome to the latest LAND webinar um, uh, organized by the Community of Democracies. I'm Maria Leisner, the Secretary General of the Community of Democracies, and uh, I'm also a LAND network advisor. Uh, LAND, or Leaders Engaged in New Democracies, it is an initiative that drives democratic transitions through investing in future leaders. Uh, it serves as a platform for exchange of knowledge uh, between experienced leaders from democratic states and promising leaders from states currently undergoing democratic change. Today's webinar will analyze how uh, it, it will analyze the key factor or key factors that contributed to a successful democratic transition in Indonesia. Uh, we will also discuss some of the challenges uh, that arose throughout the process and how those were overcome. All online viewers are welcome to post questions or comments by emailing them to uh, land at community-democracies.org. Um, our guest today, and I'm very honored to welcome uh, Professor Devi uh, Fortuna Anbar, uh, who currently serves as Deputy, uh, Deputy Secretary for Political Affairs to the Vice President of, of the Republic of Indonesia. She is a research professor and held the position of the Deputy Chairman for Social Sciences uh, and Humanities at the Indonesian Institute of Sciences, uh, LIPI, from 2001 to 2010. Uh, she's also the Chair of the Institute of Demo for Democracy and Human Rights at the Habibi Center uh, and a member of the Board of Advisors at the uh, Institute for Peace and Democracy, Bali Democracy Forum. Uh, Professor uh, Anbar was a member of uh, the UN Secretary General's Advisory Board on Disarmament Matters uh, between 2008 and 2012, and also a member of a Weapons of Mass Destruction Committee Commission uh, that was based in Stockholm, and a member of the International Advisory Board of Asia's of the Asia Pacific College of Diplomacy um, in Australia. Uh, as of this year, Professor Anbar has also joined uh, the Academic Advisory Board of the Community of Democracies. Uh, Professor Anbar, you are warmly welcome to this webinar. Um, uh, undoubtedly, uh, you have a very robust knowledge uh, of the transition in Indonesia. And we have asked you uh, to uh, address um, a, a couple of issues um, in, in uh, an introductory remark. Um, on giving an outline of the transition process, um, uh, look at the challenges and the ways that they were overcome. You have the floor, please. Welcome. Thank, thank you very much, Maria. Please just call me Dewi because well. and, uh, and it's lovely uh, to be able to <coughs> with you face to face uh, after meeting uh, you and the team uh, at the Secretariat in Warsaw uh, just a couple of weeks ago. So uh, I've actually prepared a very brief presentation uh, on Indonesia's transition to democracy, uh, which we divided into the following uh, small segments. Uh, the first will be about the fall of Suharto, and then debates about the reform agenda, then uh, Indonesia's reform path. I will also look at the roles of civil society and also role of international donors, which is very important in democratic transition and some concluding remarks. And maybe later on we can, uh, in the uh, discussions, we can talk a bit more about uh, military reform. So uh, let me begin by, by saying that uh, the fall of Suharto in May 1998 was precipitated by the Asian financial crisis that led to collapse of the Indonesian economy, uh, massive unemployment and severe economic hardship triggering mass demonstrations by university students. And because of that, the legitimacy of the Sohato's new order government, which ruled Indonesia with an iron hand for 32 years, between 1966 and 1998, uh, largely depended on, on its ability to achieve economic growth. And the legitimacy uh, of that government uh, was undermined because of this. Uh, for a long time during the uh, new order government, Political dissents were controlled through both repression and co-optation. Uh, the government emphasized the Asian values development model, which emphasized social economic rights over civil and political rights. And for three decades, people largely accepted this trade-off because 
Indonesia was doing very well economically. In fact, it was regarded as one of the 10 economic miracles. So everybody was quite uh, willing to accept uh, restrictions and their civil and political rights. However, once the economy collapsed, the pillar holding up the new order government also fell, leading to regime collapse as well. So this led to discussions that the seemingly mighty new order regime was based on a shaky power structure. Uh, but we have to understand that criticisms against the new order regime had in fact emerged long before the actual fall of Suharto, precisely because the economic development model was very successful and a new middle class was emerging in Indonesia. And because of that new uh, emerging middle class, there's also the demands for greater participation. And, and the Suharto government, despite the restrictions, uh, I did allow some space for debates uh, among the civil society groups, think tanks, uh, and the media uh, from the early 1990s. Well, of course, it was very restricted. We always had to ask for uh, government permissions in order to organize a seminar, for example. But there were at the time already uh, some interests uh, and some uh, uh, aspirations among uh, intellectuals you know, for greater freedom. Uh, and at the time, there were some general agreements uh, that were being articulated about areas that needed to be reformed. It was prior to the, the economic crisis. Everybody uh, uh, argued at the time that we needed to limit the presidential terms because President Sohato was always elected every five years and, and uh, by 1998 uh, he was on his seventh term because in our constitution then uh, there was no presidential terms limitation. There's also discussions about the need to end the dual function of the Indonesian military. Uh, uh, some of you are already familiar that the new order of government was not a military hunter per se. So the military was not exercising power as a military uh, force uh, itself. But our constitution allowed the possibility that the military also had a social political function. So uh, based on this legalese, uh, 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 which was allowed by a loophole in the constitution, the, uh, the, the military not only uh, was a professional military force, but it was also a social political force. And as such, they became the dominant political force. Uh, so there was already discussions about how we needed to end the dual function of the military. Uh, Indonesia during the new order period was also very centralized, everything was decided by Jakarta. There was, despite the motto of unity and diversity, increasingly under the Sohato government, it was unity and uniformity. So uh, everything was uh, planned in Jakarta and, and the regions had to conform to Jakarta and there was little recognition of regional diversity. So for example, uh, just a model of a, a schoolhouse, uh, there was an instruction how to build a schoolhouse and it would be uniform throughout the country. Uh, and and uh, activities were uh, were always you know uniform and in fact there were some uh, accusations that the centralization had in fact uh, led to Javanization you know the the, the domination of the uh, majority uh, ethnic group uh, in Java uh, and on, of course you know there was also call for the ending of the domination of the executive body uh, during this period uh, the executive was. Uh, overwhelmingly powerful. Uh, as, as I mentioned earlier, the executive was already dominated by the military, uh, but at the same time, uh, the executive also dominated all the other, the other legislative uh, branches uh, at the central and regional levels, and also uh, co-opted the judiciary. So the uh, parliament was more or less like a rubber stamp in which uh, the uh, military and also the government party, Golka, uh, were the uh, predominant and uh, we had elections but you know they were they were we were a democracy on paper but uh, in substance uh, indonesia was uh, really uh, not democratic at all and then there was also calls for ending what we call kkn which is a short word for corrupt corrupt collusion corruption and nepotism because of this absence of a, uh, a real check and balance of power as you know uh, absolute power uh, breeds corruption so uh, the Indonesian political system was then considered to be uh, a kleptocracy, you know, where, where the corruption was really embedded in the system. But uh, despite all of these debates, there was no clearly defined grand vision of the ideal state 
uh, you know, beyond normative statements about democracy, justice, protection of human rights, a respective place in the global system, and, and, and so on. Uh, the reform agenda was more what people did not like about the new order regime. Uh, as I said, you know, which was overly dominated by the executive, controlled by the military, bureaucracy, and Gorka, uh, centralized everything from Jakarta, prone to corruption, collusion, and nepotism, and, community, and committed human rights abuses in the name of state security. Uh, however, there was a consensus on a number of main issues, and I think you know, this, is, uh, this consensus was critical to the uh, relative success of Indonesia's uh, transition experience. First, everyone agreed then that regime change must not be through violence anymore. And I think this is very important because it, in the past, regime change in Indonesia had led to bloodshed. If you remember the regime change from President Sukarno to President Sohato, you know, there was uh, a true traumatic experience for, for Indonesia. Uh, and there are still debates about how many people were killed. Uh, people, followers of the Communist Party uh, were killed and imprisoned and, and, and was uh, uh, massacred. Uh, of sympathizers, so up, you know, people debate about whether it's fifty thousand or one million people were killed at the time. Uh, so there was this this agreement that when we need, uh, when we undergo another regime change, it should not uh, allow uh, violence anymore. And also that the political system must have sufficient resilience and adaptability against shocks. So we do not want to have to go through this endless. Uh, experience, you know, we experimented with experimented with parliamentary democracy, and then after uh, uh, facing roadblocks, that parliamentary system collapsed, and then we had uh, uh, nearly four decades of authoritarian rules, and then after that, uh, the collapse of uh, you know the, of Sukarno, and then the collapse of another authoritarian rule under Suharto. So there is this feeling that we must build a political system that is able to reinvent itself, you know, to have some resilience. So if there are uh, challenges ahead, uh, it, it should be able to reform itself from within. Uh, it doesn't have to go there uh, through this traumatic uh, uh, upheaval again. And also there is this agreement that Indonesia must change from a security approach to a prosperity approach. So rather than prioritizing, prioritizing security and stability over everything else, and allowing you know, uh, uh, abuses of human rights and uh, control of civil and political liberties for the sake of political stability, which would enable develop economic development to go on, there is now a shift of emphasis that we need to have a prosperity approach because only through a prosperity approach could a real stability uh, be achieved. So uh, stability through a more uh, uh, inclusive approach in which democracy, rule of law, and human rights would be key principles. Uh, so rather than seeing democracy and human rights as a luxury, uh, now there is this uh, paradigm shift that these are in fact requisites for a truly uh, sustainable and, and stable political system. Uh, however, as, as usual, we may, the, uh, the activists, the pro-democracy uh, uh, warriors may agree on uh, what needed to be changed, but there were a lot of disagreements about what should be prioritized and how should changes be carried out, who should be re responsible for changes, and the pace of reform. Uh, and we must remember that in the 1998-99, Indonesia was in the middle of a deep financial crisis. And, and because of this financial crisis, we had this system collapse, political crisis, and their authority of the state was truly undermined so that uh, if you remember uh, at the time there were racial riots in Jakarta, there were communal conflicts in the region, there were uh, uh, increasing uh, regional grievances uh, in Aceh and in Papua, there were problems in East Timor, so there were really a, a, a truly uh, multi-dimensional uh, crisis uh, taking place at the time. So economic stabilization, establishing law and order and creating a legitimate government were linked to each other and mutually reinforcing so the, in order to be able to uh, stabilize the economy in which the rupiah had plunged you know, from uh, 2,000 rupiah to a one US dollar, at the time it went down nearly to, to, to $20,000. So there was massive unemployment. Uh, uh, people were suffering. You know, Indonesia lost some of the middle class that it had been so proud uh, about. 
but in order to stabilize that, we need to uh, have political stability. Uh, while at the time, the, the authority of the state uh, had lost its legitimacy. And, um, and, and then, you know, there were, there were a breakdown of law and order. So how, where to start? The, these are all priorities. So restoring legitimacy of state institutions were the most critical as the state seemed to have lost its right and ability to govern. And really nothing could be done if the central government itself uh, was not considered uh, uh, legitimate. And at the time, uh, the primary debate uh, was about le le the, the legitimacy of the post Suharto government. Vice President B.J. Habibi was, of course, handpicked by President Suharto. And after Suharto's resignation, uh, according to the Constitution, the Vice President uh, would resume the presidency. However, there were division of views at the time. Some supported uh, Habibi's constitutional right to govern. Some gradually supported Habibi on condition that he made it very clear that his was only a, trans a transitional government and that he would not seek re-election. But there were others who wanted Habibi to step down immediately and be replaced by some sort of a people committee. So for the first few months, you know, there were these three groups of people and it was very, very difficult uh, to carry out a reform program when there were these endless demonstrations and there were just these debates whether Habibi would be allowed to go on to carry out the reform or whether he would be shunted aside and that this so-called people committee uh, would take over. Uh, but in the end, and this is a very important, despite the daily demonstration by students against the new government demanding that uh, the President Habibi step down, the key groups uh, in society at the time, including from the opposition parties, all agreed that Indonesia would follow a constitutionalist path towards democratic reform. So meaning that uh, a constitutionalist path would mean that the vice president, uh, according to the constitution, would take over the, the, uh, uh, the presidency after President Sohato stepped down. So he would, despite his weak political legitimacy, he was allowed uh, to go on. So President Habibi was, uh, was you know, supported on condition that he carried out reform. And it was also agreed that the Indonesia would not allow a revolutionary approach because there was this fear of creating precedent uh, and based also on the strong belief that democrat democratic transition must also follow democratic processes which must be planned, systemic and involve wide-ranging dialogues. So this is also important. So uh, uh, there was no appetite for a revolution anymore because uh, the argument at the time that, you know, once you unleash a re revolution, it is very difficult uh, to rein it in. And so the process was not a revolution, but it was called an accelerated evolution. Each step was taken based on the existing constitution, but accelerated with a thrust towards reform. And the, uh, the battle cry was reformasi, to restore the original aspiration of the founding fathers for a just society, for removing the laws and practices of the new order which sustain authoritarianism and for introducing new universal values of democracy, human rights, good governance, etc. that had began to speculate since the end of the Cold War. And uh, the solutions adopted by Indonesia in undertaking its reform just include allowing the Habibi government to remain in power with strict control from various stakeholders. Second, the government together with opposition leaders academic, civil society organizations, religious leaders, student leaders, set up teams to identify areas of reforms. And then the government held an extraordinary session of the People's Consultative Assembly in, 19, in November 1998 with three major agenda, namely to set up a new date for general elections in June 1999, so thereby cutting short President Habibi's term. If he had been allowed to, uh, to govern until his full term, uh, he would have uh, ruled until 19 uh, until 2003 but then it was agreed that that was too long and uh, and uh, we needed to uh, to find a new source of uh, uh, legitimacy so it was agreed then that the uh, the election would be brought forward uh, to november uh, to june 1999 and then uh, very early on during the extraordinary session of the people's consultative assembly there was also a decision to to set the presidential term limits to two five-year terms, unlike in Sohato period, you know, where uh, he could go on forever. And then, then to reduce the seats allocated for the military in the forthcoming 
uh, uh, parliament. So that was the, uh, the, the decisions taken in 1998. And during the period of 17 months in which President Habib uh, uh, governed, he introduced well over 200 new laws and regulations, uh, which uh, focus on revoking uh, all of the uh, laws that restricted civil and political liberties, as well as, as, well as introducing uh, new laws that would put Indonesia on a democratic transition path, uh, as well as uh, other laws. Uh, and uh, there was a clear departure from the past that was made, uh, among others, uh, President Habibi, the, one of his first acts was to release all political prisoners. And then he revoked government control of the media, uh, also allowed freedom of expression and association, so revoking all of the earlier uh, uh, regulations on that, and also uh, revoking the restriction on political parties. During the New Order period, there were only three political parties, and then uh, the Habibi government revoked that restrictions, allowing for the uh, uh, emergence of uh, multiple parties to contest the 1999 elections. And then during this time, there were two major milestones that were achieved. Uh, introduction of a regional autonomy, a very broad range uh, decentralization policy, as well as allowing referendum uh, for the independence of East Timor. And, uh, but at the time, uh, the Habibi government did not carry out constitutional amendment because the government was, the, the, the government and also the parliament at the time was not considered democratic enough because they were still controlled by the military, uh, the, uh, the bureaucracy in Gorka. Uh, so they were not really given the, uh, uh, the right to uh, uh, reform uh, or change the constitution. Uh, so the, uh, it was allowed you know, to go on to, for the government that, that came afterward. But this is also one of the uh, important decision was that it was agreed that Indonesia would not change its constitution but rather would carry out constitutional amendment. Because the Indonesian constitution comprises the preamble to the constitution, which uh, includes in it the, uh, the vision of the state, you know, the form of the uh, state, namely, uh, namely a unitary state, the foundation of the state, which is uh, a Pancasila, uh, a pluralistic foundation of the state uh, that allows for religious tolerance. Uh, and also uh, that uh, Indonesia you know, would be a republic uh, so the, uh, there was an agreement at the time that we will not change this preamble of the constitution to avoid debate about the state uh, ideology because throughout the late 1940s and 1950s there were conflicts in Indonesia which in then led to the first failure of parliamentary democracy because some of the Islamist groups wanted Islam to be the foundation of the state. So throughout the new order period Suharto succeeded in making Pancasila the state ideology uh, and so it was argued that we should not mess around with the preamble to the constitution because we do not want to revisit you know, the debate about, about the form and, and, and ideology of the state. So uh, the, the, the body of the constitution would be uh, amended but not uh, the preamble, uh, which contains the fundamental principles uh, uh, of the, the republic. So uh, there were, you know, did not, the Habibi government did not really uh, attempt to in, uh, carry out uh, constitutional amendments. So the priorities of the transitional government was really to create an enabling environment which would make it possible for new political actors to contest the general election and set the stage for more wide-ranging reforms to take place in, in later period. And, and as you know, until now, Indonesia's transitional process is still ongoing. Hmm. It went through several stages of difficult negotiations with many false steps and missed turns. There were four constitutional amendments during the first democratically elected parliament that was between the period of 1999 and 2004, uh, carried out by the People's Consultative Assembly, which comprised of parliament and regional representatives. New laws were introduced uh, uh, on the military and, and the police uh, in 2002 and 2004. And during that time, the police and the military were already separated. And the decisions were made that the military would no longer have its dual functions. Uh, it was gradually phased out of parliament and, and by uh, 2004 elections, it was already uh, decided that members of parliament would all be elected and that therefore that shut the loophole uh, would make it possible for uh, functional groups, including the military, uh, to have seats in parliament. And it was already also decided at the time that uh, uh, the military would be responsible 
for defense, while the police would be responsible for internal law, security, and law and order. And that for the military, uh, if any members of the military want, uh, uh, wanted to contrast political uh, uh, office, for example, they have to resign uh, from their, from their uh, commission. The same goes for the civil service. As you know, the bureaucracy was the backbone also of the new order government. And in 1999, a law was already passed that civil servants uh, cannot uh, uh, be uh, active members of political parties, not, no longer allowed uh, to be, uh, you know, uh, to uh, involve the bureaucracy in, in, in practical politics. And the same goes uh, to the police. So while the civil servants, while civil servants are allowed to uh, vote in general elections, but not allowed to be members of political parties, the military and the police actually are not even allowed to vote because there is this fear that uh, because of their experience in the past, it's very difficult for them uh, to be truly neutral. So there is still this concern that the military and the police will still need some time in order to be truly professional so that they could uh, vote in general elections. And definitely they are not allowed to, to contest any, any uh, government positions. Uh, during this time, as you know, there was this uh, many, many uh, important laws that were introduced. Uh, the original autonomy law that Indonesia became uh, a truly decentralized uh, from, uh, uh, you know, centralization. But there was problems. Many laws introduced during the early transitive period uh, were problematic because they were rushed in. And, and there were also, there was a lot of negotiations, you know, the amendments and changes could only be made incrementally. So we've already undergone a number of revisions to uh, of the, uh, to our laws <coughs> uh, and the original autonomy law. So, so that was some of the challenges that, that we faced uh, when we wanted to have reform quickly. Uh, uh, sometimes we have to sacrifice quality over speed. And at the same time, you know, because of the, the differences of political interest, uh, Civil societies have idealistic visions of what need to be need, needed to be done, but uh, on the ground, you know, political groups have their different uh, conflicting interests, uh, and uh, um, and at every stage, uh, at every step of the way, there were negotiations. So that in the end, uh, I said that you know changes could only be made incrementally. Now I like to touch a little bit on the roles of civil civil society because civil society was really really key to the success of Indonesia's transition. Uh, it was made very clear that at the time, it was not just the students who were demonstrating on the streets who broke the government of the uh, Suharto down, you know, who, who changed the, uh, who broke the regime down, but in order to build up a new political system, uh, here the role of intellectuals, particularly academics and think tanks, were very important for articulating issues to frame debates and to act as consultant to state actors. Because at the time, you know, there was still, and still, but Indonesia is still very limited in its capacity. Parliament, uh, because it has been a, a rubber stamp for a long time, did not really have the capacity to, to draft legislations uh, that, because most of the capacity was in the executive body. So here, the role of civil society, think tanks and academia in particular were very important in helping to assist both people in the executive branch and in the legislative branch in framing the debates and in writing position papers and academic papers for legislations. Civil society organizations also act as pressure groups and ensure that certain laws are revoked or passed. So they also act as watchdogs. So while they are, uh, you know, the think tanks were working behind closed doors to frame uh, legislative agenda, uh, there were the role of their uh, demonstrations and uh, organ, uh, civil society organizations, mass organizations were also important because they they keep uh, they kept everybody honest. Basically, they kept the pressure, and then the media was also very important for this. Uh, TV talk shows featuring intellectuals, CSO actors also played a very important role in shaping the reform agenda and public education. And for the first time, then emergence of surveys and polls also became very important tools for gauging public perceptions. And uh, there is the need to support the development of strong and autonomous civil society organizations here as uh, partners of government. So this is a change in paradigm also, because during the New Order period, the civil society was, of course, as an, was regarded as an enemy of the government because they were very critical. So now there was this understanding that civil society uh, 
uh, needs to be strong and autonomous, but at the same time, uh, they, they, they also need it to be regarded as, as partners uh, in, in making uh, changes. And, and I think very, very important also to touch on the role of the international donors, because uh, the Indonesian democratic uh, transition would not have su succeeded as well as, as it had without the supportive role of the international donors here. Mm. But at the same time, while mobilizing international donors uh, to support this, uh, the reform process had to be, you know, owned also by the national stakeholders. Mm. So this is this is a very important balance uh, that we have uh, 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 to keep in mind. There is a very strong international interest on Indonesia's democratic transition. And there were many offers of assistance, but while highlighting Indonesia's democratic transition as part of the changing international mainstream, efforts were made to develop local and national narratives for Indonesia's need for democratic reform. It would be a kiss of death if the think tanks, the academics, and so on, who talk about democracy, and most of us were Western educated, if we were seen to be agents of change sponsored by the West, because that would have lost us the support of, of, uh, of the wider public. So while it was very important that, you know, the international donors uh, give this uh, support, uh, the developing the national narratives and, and uh, having locally uh, owned uh, movement uh, is, is very critical. So government and non-governmental stakeholders accepted international assistance, but never allowed the latter to become too visible. So democracy must be locally owned. So that's very important for organizations like Community of Democracies as well. While giving assistance, it, does not, it's not, it's not, it must not be perceived that it is setting the agenda because yeah. one could lose credibility uh, uh, because of that. And so at uh, the time, the Habibi government asked the UNDP to coordinate international assistance to prevent competition between donors and also to prevent too close an association with a particular donor country. We do not want to have you know, a Swedish model or an American model or an, an Australian model, each donor uh, agency carrying its own national flag, for example, pushing for its own agenda of reform. So at the time, uh, the Habibi government as the UNDP, which at the time did not really have experience in democratic transition management, to assist uh, in, in uh, coordinating uh, the donor uh, assistant. Because the UNDP was regarded as a neutral, a multilateral agency, and it was regarded as, as non-political. Mm. So, in, so in conclusions, uh, one could, uh, I could say uh, uh, the following uh, points, that harnessing revolutionary zeal for change towards a more systematic reform process is not easy. Disagreements emerge over our agenda, pace, agency, and strategy. Transition to democracy is a long drawn out process and at times messy. It needs patience, focus, and the understanding that achieving democracy must be through democratic processes. There is just no shortcut to that. Participation, inclusiveness, transparency are some of the key to legitimacy. Even an unpopular transitional government could achieve a great deal due to external pressure, as well as the desire to prove its reformist credential to both supporters and critics. The presence of unrelenting external pressure, both domestic and international, is of course critical to ensuring progress. So don't be too enthusiastic about simply overthrowing the existing regime because it is considered to be illegitimate. Because from the Indonesian experience, the Habibi government, despite its weak legitimacy, was able to carry out the necessary uh, reform. Uh, but of course, there was this unrelenting uh, pressure, both from the international uh, environment as well as uh, from the domestic uh, environment. However, for, for more fundamental changes, uh, more time is clearly needed. From Indonesia's experience, rushing through laws led to poor quality and problems at implementation because there are a number of contradictory laws and con confusing definitions uh, as well. So a lot of our earlier laws had to be, you know, uh, set aside and, and new laws had to be uh, 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 reintroduced or some in fact, have undergone a number of revisions already. And time is needed to develop consensus on long-term objectives. Despite agreement on ultimate goals, politics and vested interests often make wholesale changes impossible to achieve. So resulting in incremental changes. So, so there's no shortcut to democratic reform and we need patience. Uh, mm -hmm. I think I think that you know that is what my my you know my my remarks. 
Yes. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, David. That, that was a wonderfully rich uh, presentation of the Indonesian transition. And uh, I, I learned a lot. I think that all of us listening learned a lot. Uh, you were very, very clear, very precise. And you, um, I particularly appreciate you underlined that uh, there was an agreement on, on the issues um, uh, that, uh, that needed to be addressed. Um, the issue of the, uh, you mentioned the, the dual function of the military, uh, the centralization. That was too hard, the balance of power between the executive, the legislative, and the judiciary, uh, and also the introduction of, of the checks and balances. And that was basically the, the reform program that was needed. And uh, uh, the consensus um, uh, about uh, achieving that, uh, not through violence, but through a peaceful uh, uh, transition, that the regime change just had to be peaceful. Um, and uh, that you would apply the prosperity approach, not the security approach, that you would switch the focus of the country to, um, uh, to try to look for how can we achieve prosperity and, uh, and realizing that that only comes, uh, can be derived from political stability. Um, uh, and, and you also outlined some of the, um, uh, 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 the, the uh, issues, uh, the problems that you needed to, to overcome, uh, the importance to uh, go slowly when it comes to the constitution, not to open up Pandora's box completely. Um, uh, and uh, I think that that all um, it gave us a very, very clear picture. Now, a question that I have, and I know many with me, is how was it possible to, um, uh, even though there was pressure, and even though there was the external pressure from the financial crisis and the internal pressure, from the outbreaks of discontent from the regions and also um, and other types of discontent. How was it still possible to talk the, um, the owners of the old system into accepting a peaceful change that they would in the end risk ending up losing, losing their power, losing their positions, perhaps being more exposed to criticism, who knows being um, accused of, of corruption, I know what, uh, and we're talking about a number of different actors in the previous establishment. Um, what was it that made it possible uh, for for them to accept this peaceful change where where their power would be reduced? I think the uh, the, the primary uh, concern was the fate of Indonesia, because we have seen what happened in in the former. Soviet bloc, uh, and we have seen what happened in Yugoslavia. Uh, Indonesia, being a very diverse country, has to be very, very careful that we do not allow, you know, this political transition to lead to the breakup of the country. In fact, many people were already writing on the wall that this was, you know, Indonesia is becoming balkanized, uh, that Indonesia will not survive, you know, uh, uh, this, this, uh, multi-dimensional crisis uh, and, and and as, as you said you know there, there are already uh, many many uh, problems uh, in, in in the regions so the political elites including those who are supporting the status quo uh, at the end of the day I believe that they're all patriots you know they they b believe in the dream the dream of Indonesia that Indonesia should remain uh, a unitary republic that Indonesia should not uh, allow uh, intra state conflicts, the, the, the killings between Muslims and Christians, between the Dayaks and the um, Maduris and, and so on, to continue because otherwise everyone would be the loser. So that was, you know, that was the preamble the, to the constitution uh, in a way did keep us together. The dream of a unitary republic of Indonesia uh, uh, did keep us together. And, and, and the experience of the past also that uh, if, uh, the, the transition was to be violent because those who would lose power was not willing to give it up, uh, then, uh, you know, Indonesia would go on through this endless cycle. Maybe a new regime would have emerge, but then, you know, uh, then there will be a challenge again. So there was already this desire that we have to change. Mm. But at the same time, this is, that is the positive uh, spin. But then the negative spin, and this is one of the criticisms that Indonesia's transition has been less, less perfect because the, the one who's in charge of the transition was actually the old guards, put it that way, is that there's been impunity. So 
uh, there was a desire to bring Suhatu to trial, for example, but it would it uh, there was a lot of pressure from from some of the more uh, radical students to do that. But there were bombs exploding in Jakarta. There was you know uh, the, the real instability would take place. So the, in in the end, uh, not just the uh, people from the military or Gorka, the bureaucracy, who said, you know, we should just move on, you know, to forgive and forget, you know, put it that way, mm. uh, the past, just and move on rather than looking back. Uh, and, and, and there was, in a way, impunity. Yes. So, as, 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 as you remember, there were very little, very few uh, top generals who were brought to trial uh, yes. in some human rights abuses. Uh, uh, there were some lower ranking officers who were brought to trial for uh, for kidnappings or for various human rights violations, but there were no major figures you know who were brought to to, to trial. So in a way, there was a deal that uh, the past would be the past uh, that uh, they will not be uh, put to uh, uh, put to trial. And remember, Gorka, there was demand that Gorka would should be disbanded in the way that the Communist Party was disband, disbanded uh, mm -hmm. in 1966 uh, for uh, the uh, for the uh, uh, alleged uh, 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 crime of uh, uh, staging a coup, you know, in 1965. So there were some of the more radical uh, uh, groups demanding that Gorka should also be disbanded. But at the time, uh, because Habibi was in power, he was in fact, you know, uh, uh, chair of the uh, trustees of Gorka. Uh, Parliament that was to take charge of the early transition was still dominated by Gorka and the military, and we needed to work with these people. Uh, it, it was regard, uh, it was agreed at the time that uh, Gorka would be allowed. It had to reinvent itself mm. in a way. So there were there, there had, we had to make a lot of compromises. And, and, and in many countries, uh, uh, some of the failure of the transition is because the unwillingness to make these compromises. Some of the uh, you know the the, uh, the democracy activists were just totally unwilling. To, to work together with the, the with the old guards, and the old guards would be unwilling to compromise. You know, so in Indonesia we did have to make these compromises. In a way, uh, it has been uh, uh, very good for Indonesia because it has enabled us to move uh, in a relatively soft landing. You know, uh, in our uh, transition, and 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 and, our, and Indonesia's democracy has become stronger, and we have you know we are now at the point of consolidating our democracy, but some of the old habits remain problematic you know corruption is still an issue in indonesia even with the new with the entry of new actors uh the system is still very prone to to democracy uh, to, 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 corrupt, to corruption and and um, although uh, the uh, the state is no longer engaged in human rights abuses there are there's still criticism that uh, some of the past uh, operators you know have not really been given the necessary uh, justice that you know that, that justice not really prevailed. As as you say, uh, a transition can be a rather messy process. It, it's not always as 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 clean and lovely as as you would like. And also, you said it requires patience, and uh, maybe uh, to have complete um, um, uh, rule of law and and to deal with past uh, crimes uh, against human rights, you will probably need to wait uh, still some time. I, uh, there, there are um, a couple of things that I've noticed about the uh, Indonesian transition, and one is that it's always very healthy when you see that, that, that the militaries are running for positions in the in the parliament, because then you know uh, that they have realized that uh, you have to be elected by the people in order to have a position of power, and uh, uh, that happened uh, in Guatemala after the transition there. It happened also in Indonesia. And uh, even though you might not be entirely happy about having a number of retired generals um, um, entering into politics, I still think it is a very healthy sign that uh, they are realizing that the game has changed and that you need actually the, the, the support to people. The other well, thing is that it really, really takes a long time in many countries uh, uh, to, um, uh, to have the, um, uh, the, the issue of impunity um, to catch up with the political transition. Very often that comes much, much later because you need to have the political agreement uh, to do the political transition. 
and and uh, uh, then maybe you need to go uh, a little bit softly. But in the end, I'm absolutely certain that uh, Indonesia, as well as any other country, uh, simply has to find a way of dealing with uh, all the, the past uh, human rights abuses. It, uh, it uh, uh, catches up in the end and it, it continues to uh, to be an issue. But even in, in long established um, uh, democracies, uh, there are uh, huge abuses of human rights that are still undealt with. And we know that inevitably we will have to deal with them. Uh, but um, democracies need patience, uh, both when uh, being formed and established and also afterwards. Uh, so, uh, Debbie, I am extremely grateful for your your very, very rich contribution here. Uh, you are um, uh, uh, You really gave us a wonderful overview. Uh, over success factors, uh, some of them unique to Indonesia, but I think most of them very, very universal in character. And, and I wish to extend a heartful thanks uh, uh, to you uh, for wanting to participate in our webinar. Um, uh, this um, uh, will be posted also on YouTube, uh, so there is a possibility for all of you who have been watching uh, to um, actually recommend your friends and others to uh, to look at it and and to get um, a condensed brief of the most uh, important l uh, things to be learned from the Indonesian transition that can be applied, I believe, to any transition uh, in the future. Uh, dear again, uh, my my warmest thanks to you. Uh, lovely to speak to you. Uh, like this, and hope that uh, we may enjoy talking to you soon again. Thank you very much, Maria. I, I, I must say that for those people in the military who uh, has an um, who have ambition to join politics, in fact, the Indonesian experience shows that a lot of political parties are very interested in inviting retired military officers uh, to join their political parties because military officer, uh, officers are regarded as being good at management, you know, they are they're good at organizing and so on. And in fact, very interestingly, the son of uh, President Susilo Bambang Yudhoyono, who has a very promising career in the military, who is a major, uh, resigned from his commission in order to contest the governor's election in Jakarta. So, uh, so clearly, there, is, there is a place for military leaders, even under civilian rule. <laughs> Exactly. So as long as they are out of their uniform. Exactly. Lovely. Thanks again, Debbie. Thank you very much, Maria. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.